Uh, good morning, everybody. This is uh, John Single, and we are going to have our episode four of our webinar series um, focusing on pro project program and portfolio management excellence. Um, this is episode four, focusing on PPM for new product development and innovation. Um, so this should be an interesting um, session. Um, as we've discussed on prior sessions, this was a six-part series. Um, we started out initially with a, you know, the, the PPM opportunity and the program management office. We talked about agile waterfall. We talked about portfolio and project management intake processes. And here we're talking about uh, new product development and innovation. We're also going to talk about, um, you know, the innovative organization and how do we align an organizational structure um, to support innovation. Um, and then we've, next session will be on resource management and PPM, which will be interesting in terms of, you know, how do we manage resources and how do we uh, efficiently allocate resources. So let's talk about um, new product development and innovation. <clears throat> um, by the way, we are, I'm with, um, I'm the pro, for those of you who haven't been on the session before, I am the practice director for Quantum PM. We are a gold Microsoft partner um, specializing in implementation of project portfolio management solutions um, using the Microsoft stack. I mean, our whole um, premise is that, you know, we, we, we design industry best practice solutions um, that really allow companies to derive value for their organizations. And we use, you know, Microsoft technology as a mechanism for achieving that. Um, we've been around since 2000. Um, we do a lot of work with integration. So, um, you know, if, if you know, you know, we, we have a lot of, you know, insights into, you know, how we can use the Microsoft stack to deliver value to your org overall organization. Okay, let's let's go back to if we're going to set the stage for um, PPM for new product development. Um, you know, I think that the first thing we need to do is go back to episode one of our, our series here. You know, the impact of digital disruption. Um, it's it's kind of fascinating because you know if you look across the the, the gamut of different industries that are out there, um, you know, speed of innovation, um, the importance of um, emerging technologies, um, new delivery mechanisms, emerging competitors. Um, you know, all of these things are impacting you know, wide variety of industries. And like we, you know, talked about in some of our earlier episodes, you know, some of these, in, some industries are more susceptible towards um, high degree of, of change and high degree of um, innovation um, that's required because of the just general disruption into the industry. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the development of ideas, you know, the, inter, in, the creation of the process for generating, developing and communicating new ideas, um, you know, it's it's absolutely critical from an organizational perspective that you know we embrace the um, you know the, the new delivery models and the emerging technologies. Um, and I think it was interesting about this particular study that was done on the right here. It's a McKinsey study that was done in January, which talks about you know what happens to people who fail to adopt. Um, and I think you know if you look at it, incumbent business models of roughly 100%. You know the ones who you know, when, when, when the majority of incumbents, they get to this trough in the middle here, you know, they fail to a top, but the bold movers are the ones who are embracing and achieving the largest uh, share of benefit um, in the new digital model. Um, a good example of that is, you know, if you think about the innovators at Amazon, um, um, Apple, um, companies like that, and, and, and think companies like Toyota and General Motors, we'll talk about some of those as well, but, you know, the whole idea of the, of the digital business model driven by innovation, um, you know, this is definitely a winner take all type um, to type trend we're seeing. So it's important that we um, establish and, and have the ability to innovate and develop new products. Um, we talk about displacement and disruption in extreme cases, outright destruction. And, and there's some good examples here of, you know, what's going on in some of these different industries. I mean, for example, we talk about Bitcoin and blockchain that's in, impacting the traditional banking and insurance industries. Um, you also see that technology in terms of blockchain impacting pharmaceuticals. I mean, one of the, in healthcare, I mean, one of the things, you know, healthcare companies are trying to do is, is the seamless, you know, ability to access information consistently between providers and, and payers um, all the way across. Um, you're seeing in the educational space where you've got uh, Concorsa and, and edX, you know, threatening business schools with open online courses. Um, you're seeing, you know, microtransactions which are impacting um, internet services. Um, you see what's going on with Uber. I mean, if you go to the airport these days, you know, very few people are sitting there and taking taxi cabs. They're largely driving Ubers. So it's really it's interesting about this is that. You know, you see these emerging technologies and traditional innovation, but, you know, established players can disrupt traditional ways of doing business, you know, um, by ge generally reframing and, and, and changing their business model and engagement model. Um, this is, the, and the thing is, we talked about innovation, and one of the things that's, you know, we're going to talk about earlier is that, you know, 
when it comes to innovation, um, really there's two types. We do new product development, for example. If you think about new product development, um, you know, if you come up with an, a new product that's innovative, you know, you run the risk of somebody else stealing or copying the idea. Okay, so the challenge there is really how do we maintain the, and, and gain the long-term economic benefit associated with a piece of innovation. Um, so a lot of this is, I mean, this, there's some examples, is really business model innovation, which really talks about how do you view um, what you consider, consider the, um, the, the notions of your particular industry and how do you change it and put it upside your head. Um, it's really, I mean, this is a good example that McKinsey put out in July of 2015, you know, the turning of one of the, the underlying notions of, of, the, of the business you're in. You know, basically incumbents can look for new forms of mechanisms to create value. And here's really, you know, a five-step approach. You know, think about the business model that you, that you have in your industry. <clears throat> Dissect the long-term notions and beliefs of your, of your particular industry. Turn the idea on its head. Like, think about what, what, what if, what are the possibilities that we have out there? You know, sanity test your chain, your your concept, and then translate these reframe beliefs into um, a new business model and take advantage of some of the opportunities that can be out there. Um, here's a good example: what makes a successful big company an innovator? Um, you know, and, and the, it was kind of interesting about this is that there was a couple, um, again, another one of these McKinsey studies that talked about this. Um, you know, talked about eight essentials for complex company-wide um, innovation. Um, you know, that's really, you know, that's required for a company to become an innovator. And really the first, if you look on the right there, the first four are what we would call strategic and creative essentials. You know, things that companies need to do from a strategic and a creative um, capabilities. We need to aspire. Do you have innovation-led growth as a critical success factor? Choose. Do you invest in a coherent time and risk-balanced portfolio of initiatives? Discover. Do you have differentiated business, market, technology insights that translate into winning propositions? And evolve. Can you create new business models that provide defensible and scalable profit sources? So, you know, those are all things that from an organizational piece, we remember last month we talked about the whole, you know, stability of the organization. I mean, this would f factor into that um, metric as well. Um, in terms of the delivery essentials, we, this really is fo focuses on our ability to, you know, to incubate and deliver these um, new concepts, you know, in terms of acceleration, can you beat the comp competition of developing and launching innovation quickly and effectively? Okay, that's when we get to the innovation hub, um, having delivery processes and, and, and technology in place to support that. Scale, can you launch innovations at the right scale of the relevant markets and segments? Okay, it's great to have ideas, but can you scale these things and actually deliver them in a place that you establish a position in the marketplace? Um, for example, if you produce a, a service or, or a product, if you can't scale it, somebody else is going to come in and do it for you. So you need to be able to scale, um, you know, and, and, and take your innovation and, and assume a larger share in the marketplace. Extend. Do you by creating and capitalizing on an external network? Um, leverage it. Um, for example, you know, they talk about this whole con concept of an ecosystem and, you know, how we're no longer dealing with, you know, standalone entities. And really what we're focused here is, you know, external integration with third parties and, and um, you know, affinity group um, entities. You know, can you extend your innovation into other areas? And, and there's another areas here, you know, from a development perspective is, you know, partnering with um, other third parties and um, others to actually develop innovation. I mean, a good example is aerospace. I mean, when they did for the 787 Dreamliner, Boeing partnered with a lot of the airlines um, that are out there. Um, then the last one here is this whole mobilize. Are your people motivated, rewarded, and organized to innovate repeatedly? I mean, is innovation in the DNA of your organization? Um, and that's, you know, those are things that can, you know, really make a big, um, you know, allow you to achieve success from an innovation perspective. You know, and, and as we've seen repeatedly across this whole webinar series, you know, the, you, if people who fail to innovate and create, you know, they're going to be left behind and, and to the innovator goes the spoils. Um, this is an interesting question as we talked about the, um, the, eight, the eight essentials. Um, you know, what happens if you do it? Um, so it's really interesting. If a company assimilates and apply these essentials in their own way, um, you know, in according to the capabilities of their organization. And then we talk about, you know, the pace of change has gone into hyperspace, but companies must get these strategic, creative, executional, and organizational factors right to innovate successfully. And it's the chart on the right is kind of interesting. It talks about, you know, the innovative companies and who actually is good at, um, you know, establishing trends. And the most innovative, 
you know what they do right i mean if you look at the the, the eight attributes that we had with the, the four on the left focusing on um, organizational capabilities i mean the ones that do well you know they're the ones who set you know set the cone set the discoverers that choose they aspire to achieve success and they've also got a very um you know demobilized for example they've got a workforce that's very much focused on an innovative culture um so if you think about it, it's really focused if you want to innovate as a company it's got to impact and be foundational to the DNA of the overall organization. So if you're going to build up an incubation engine or something of that sort, you need to make sure that there's a culture of innovation within the overall organization as well. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of the point I was referring to earlier, and I, I should have resequenced. This is from, you know, Harvard Business Review, where they talked about, you know, the importance of alignment between innovation and business models, you know, short term success, you know, most organizations focus on building short term product innovation engines. However, they have little sustainable competitive advantage and never, never generate a profit because somebody else will steal the idea. Right. So a significant investment in product development without a commensurate return on investment is the result of that. So if you think of it just as a product play, you know, that's that's problematic. It'll give you some short term success. But to achieve sustainable growth, companies must be better integrate their product innovation and business model processes and services um, with innovation. So I think this is a pretty important model. It really is important that you know we talk about delivering for near-term results, but also you know prepare for perpetual results year after year. And I think you know the attributes that we talked about earlier here, the, the eight essentials. I mean, it, it it really requires a transformation plan within an organization, a maturity model type um, approach to this to go out and you know build within the DNA of the organization um, these eight attributes. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, purpose of this, this whole session on innovation is really, you know, we, it's really interesting to talk about the technical, the tactical aspects of how do we run an innovation engine, but in order to have the business model and organizational alignment, I mean, all of that is absolutely essential to achieving, um, you know, the results of what we're trying to do from a, from a business perspective. Okay. This is an interesting one too, barriers and risk. I mean, we talked about, you know, you know, some of the barriers and risks that organizations change and some of the hardships that they have in terms of adopting um, innovation within the DNA of the organization. Um, you know, having a mindset to harvest and manage great ideas. I mean, that's number of problems where you don't have a, a as you would call it, innovative culture. And there's an example there of Sony had some ideas to um, build the first iPod equivalent, but couldn't commercialize those ideas because of misalignments and internal battles. Um, I mean, another good example is we talked about like Apple and the whole GUI that they came up with. You know, everyone talked about um, Xerox actually being the first ones that developed the um, the concept of the GUI, and they and they didn't know what to do with it. It was it took Steve Jobs to come along and do that. Um, number two, lack of misalignment of resources available for investment and innovation. You know, the problem is is that you know you organizationally you've got a matrix. In many cases, there's competition for um, for scarce resources, and the resources are not being aligned consistently with innovation. And I think that you know comes to the point of you know having a strategic vision for the organization and alignment for the organization, so that there's a focus on um, you know it's within the DNA of the company, and then there's alignment between people, resources, and incentives um, to allow people to um, you know to focus on innovation, have that be rewarded, have the reward schema um, aligned with the focus on innovation. Um, there, there's, another, there's another one, number three, human capitalized, underutilized, or disenfranchised from an organization's creative capacity. Um, that, that's something we, we talked about earlier in the last session about portfolio management as well. Innovation is something within an organization that shouldn't just be focused on one department, one group. Um, it's really important, it was really important that it, it be the pretty much all of the capabilities within an organization are, are being utilized to actually develop innovative concepts. Um, for example, I mean, if I'm IT, for example, do I want to innovate with an IT or do I want the people in marketing to do it? So that the customer experience and the technology experience of IT is consistent with, you know, the brand that they're trying to project into the marketplace. Um, I did a project once with an aerospace company, Build Aircraft, and, you know, that was a great example where they were selling these wonderful airplanes, but they gave you a paper purchase order. Um, and there was one where there was complete misalignment between expectations for technology and, and the brand that they were trying to push. So it's really important that there's, a, you know, this cross pollination across the organization. Um, broad product, and you know, the product and delivery capabilities um, focus on emerging and disruptive opportunities. 
Um, so I think that's pretty important that, you know, that, that, that these things are really focused on the opportunities that are out there. Um, I mean, there's some examples here between, you know, what's going on with the financial services industry. Um, there's other ones we're, 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 we'll talk about it later at some other point, um, you know, where you're seeing, you know, the emergence of what they're calling fintechs, where you've got financial, where you've got technology companies that are going into the financial services space because of the opportunities around customer experience. Um, you're seeing a blur of the lines between, you know, delivery models within organizations. Um, so you're seeing a lot of, you know, th having those type of self-imposed um, barriers are, are detrimental to your ability to deliver. And then there's the last one, you know, organizational orthodoxies that hold to the past and discourage risk taking. Um, I mean, you talk about institutional memory, you talk about things that didn't work in the past. Um, I think it's important organizationally, you need to change, as they say, the DNA for the company. I mean, a lot of companies are, are I've dealt with um, in my consulting career are, are risk averse. Um, there's a tendency to, you know, beat up on failure. I mean, the fact is, if you're doing innovation, there are some products and some things that you're going to bring to market um, that might not come to fruition. Um, so I think it's pretty important that, you know, there must be a, an encourage, basically a cultural aspect that encourages risk taking. And sometimes if an idea doesn't work, but it's a good idea, you know, that happens and there's going to be some element of that. And then there's another one here, and there's a couple other ones. When do you kill an innovative idea? Um, and, and I have good, some good examples of that. Um, you know, the first one that they talked about, this is a Harvard, HBR, Harvard Business Review, came up with this one, this list here, actually. Um, when they talk about the, um, you know, if, if basically if the innovative idea appears compelling and its numbers sound, should these three appear, don't, you know, kill the innovation. So no pleasant surprises is the second line. I should have indented that. Um, part of the part, the thing is when you're generating an idea, you're coming up with innovation, you know, you're going to, you're going to find other attributes and things that are compelling about the innovative idea. For example, you're coming up with a new product and during the development of the product, you might say to yourself, gee, I can do this or I can do that. So, you know, the scalability of, you know, what we think we can do from an enterprise perspective is pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. So they talk about the idea that, you know, you start getting a little, um, you know, people feel like there's small wins that feel much, you know, that, that you feel like you're getting value from the particular idea. Um, another example of this is that, you know, if you partner with other companies, um, the partner company should be getting excited too. So if you don't feel that sense of excitement, don't do it. Um, you know, here's another one. Number two is that the whole idea of a deeper, richer, more sophisticated insight into the value proposition. Um, so basically, it's like, what else can we do with this? Um, if you don't see other other things that you can do, or as you d dive into the business case, you know, it doesn't seem more compelling and granular or more scalable, then, then that's possibly another idea um, of, of why you should possibly kick it across. Um, and the other one is when prospective customers, clients don't have a lot of, you know, inspires little emotion. They don't look at it and say, you know, oh, that's 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 awesome or that's very cool, and they understand why it's a useful product. Um, so the, this whole idea of the difference is death um, is pretty important. Um, I've also, there's another one I want to add to this list is, is one of the clients I've, I've been doing this, you know, consult IT strategy consulting for, you know, over 20 years. And the notion of, you know, the sunk cost, um, what you see with a lot of organizations is they build, you know, projects build their own momentum. Okay. And there's, there's very much of a cultural aversion to canceling projects that are in flight because they don't want to be the ones who, um, you know, stand up and say, hey, this isn't going to work anymore. We've already invested all this money, but the business case isn't there. And, you know, there's too much of a, you know, smack their hand type um, attribute versus, um, you know, the ability to say, well, gee, you know, let's, you know, maybe the thing isn't, it was, it was a good idea at the beginning, but it's no longer there. Um, so really the risk, the idea really is that there isn't a sunk cost and there should be an organizational um, view that says, you know, sometimes these things don't work out. Um, the, the, the world could have changed. And we talked about, you know, um, you know, you know, this idea of digital transformation and, and, and rapid innovation, you know, it is possible that a business case is no longer there and we should, we should stop the project. And frankly, if it, it's not something that somebody should be punished on, um, because if you're an innovative culture, as they say, some things don't work. Um, I mean, a lot of the customers, I, I did, did a project for a CPG company, you know, and their whole, you know, life cycle is about two years for innovation to develop it. Um, I've been with some where the whole life cycle is a matter of, you know, matter of months. So, you know, you, given the duration of these things and the investments, you know, the ability to stop and pause halfway is pretty important. Here's some other ones. Here's another um Let's talk about some of the IT and the innovation funding. I mean, some there are um, technology trends that are in place here that allow you to, um, you know, move 
um, into an innovation um, incubation type activity. Um, we, one of the things you've seen over the last, you know, several years now, you know, the whole IT as a service concept, um, the idea that of standing technology products and, and delivery of technology solutions to a service-based model where you've actually got, you know, in effect, you're standardizing the, the product that you're producing from an IT perspective. Um, you've got a consumption-based pricing model, usually a chargeback supporting the um, delivery of the particular um, technology service. Um, you've know, got one of these elastic supply models. I mean, what you want there really is something that you're not relying on a fixed internal resource pool or capability pool. You want an elastic one where it could be things like, you know, external vendors, third parties providing um, scalable services to support it. And a lot of times when you get to the, the meter demand, um, what, what you find there is that companies, you know, if they actually can pay for it on an as-used basis, for example, if I'm buying a, like they're getting a laptop, they're configuring a laptop or something, you know, and it's $500 per laptop, you know, they can actually see and get granularity and visibility into what the costs are, you know, that reduces the demand for the solution. And you see this a lot with storage, um, if they're doing things like, you know, we're pushing out to a cloud, for example, but if you're, if you're reselling it and you're doing IT as a broker type model, um, you know, you have the opportunity of reducing the overall cost. So, you know, the advantage of that is if you're like an IT organization, this, as you standardize um, IT services, um, the, the cost savings that can be achieved there can be focused on innovation and an innovation incubation engine. Um, usually what I've seen is that, you know, a lot of times you can fund, you know, 10% of the budget associated with innovation. You work with a business relationship manager, so you understand some of the demand that's go what, what the market is seeing. Um, in terms of opportunities from a technology perspective and you know develop proof of concepts develop prototypes and have that incubation engine um, from a technology piece it could also be just you know it could be supporting um, development of new products it could be um, new capabilities from an organizational perspective it could be things like uh, analytics and um, data i mean I, I did a project once for a um, large heavy equipment manufacturer and what they did did was developed a um, you know rapidly spooled up analytics tool to look at um, product defects. So they had a problem with a particular type of product in a certain geography. So they could do, you know, rapid analysis and figure out what the problems are to reduce the spend on their on their um, warranty operation. So there are, I mean, there's plenty of opportunities here from a, you know, organizational perspective within an IT organization. Um, I mean, here's a good example. If you want to set up like an idle based process for IT as a service delivery, <clears throat> this is really, you know, transitioning you know, the, the costs and, and really as demand flows in to the IT organization, these are the processes that you would use to standardize it and develop a service around it where you could do consulting services where you'd work with the people to develop the and understand the requirements around um, the service, architect the service, construct and transition the service, and then you transition it over to an operations piece where it would be supported through a service catalog. So this is one way of doing it. This is just, you know, transition IT as a service. Um, Here's some other ones, technology innovation ideas. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on right now from an innovation perspective. And, you know, there's a really, if, I don't know if you guys get McKinsey Global Institute, but there was an article published last month in 2018 that talks about, they did a whole um, artificial intelligence survey. Um, and really what they're saying right now is that, if, you know, in terms of the um, capabilities that are out there, there's tr about 40% um, of the, of the, the um, in terms of the f total amount of money that the analytics impact, as they call it, you know, between 9.5 and 15.4 trillion annual impacts that are associated with analytics, you know, you see this tremendous impact of things like um, art artificial intelligence. Um, and if you think about it, in terms of certain industries and re in terms of industries and the, and the incremental value of AI over other analytical techniques, um, you're seeing AI across the board for, as far as industries are concerned. But really on the left here, you know, total impact derived from analytics, you know, in terms of the AI impact, you can see certain industries where you're seeing, I would call them early adopters, um, like retail, transportation, travel, healthcare, consumer packaged goods, public sector, um, you know, so a lot of these different things are, you know, you're seeing the impact on machine learning and, and artificial intelligence in terms of, you know, the ability to automate and, you know, gather intelligence, gather information about your customers, um, automate experiences and, and have a more of a customer centric view. Um, and what this study did, which is really worth reading, is that they talked about, you know, they developed a series of use cases against 19 industries. They did 400 use cases across 19 industries, you know, and they looked at these different industries and they talked about the incremental value of AI over other analytical techniques. And a lot of this, if you look at it, travel, transportation, retail, you know, why are these things highly impacted by artificial intelligence? Because they're, they're very much 
specific to the individual and you know they're very much taste type things so for example travel where do i want to go where do i want to stay what kind of things do i want to do um, there's a lot of interaction with the human to understand what their um, desires are in terms of a presentation and that's why you're seeing this from a from a um you know, solutioning perspective. And uh, there's some other ones in there, like, for example, um, you see a lot of this now with um, in, the in the automotive industry. Um, they talk about, like, for example, this, like Toyota, for example, is, is partnering with Google to bring Alexa into your car. So you're driving along in your car, Alexa comes on from Google, tells you what restaurant you want to go to. Um, and then from there, they can not only suggest the restaurant, but also make the reservation for you. Okay, so this whole technology integration and in, in the customer experience is pretty important. But, you know, AI is definitely an area from a customer perspective that, you know, in terms of innovation and of bringing new products to bear, you know, like in the travel industry, I did a, I did a project once with a travel provider. You know, they're talking about, you know, multi-stop trips where you can go to destinate, you can go to multiple stops, different types of hotels, different events all the way around. So it's very much of a user specific um, view that they want to take. Um, here's another example is, is in the, um, I talked about insurance technology, the emergence of what they call insure attacks, which is really in the financial services space. You know, you're seeing, you know, the, the technology companies moving into the um, you know, I'm sorry, this shouldn't even be here. Um, basically moving into the uh, insurance area and they talk about, you know, in terms of the companies with the highest revenue earning growth have disruption or making their following big bets across the business enterprise. Um, in terms of the industry, what you're seeing in terms, in, and this picture on the left here is really good. This one should not be here. I apologize for that. Let me clean this up. I forgot to delete that. Um, in terms of the insurance ecosystem, I mean, what you're seeing here is integration among the various providers. And, and this is a really great graphic here that talks about the auto insurance ecosystem. You know, you've got the car coming out with the OEMs. You have telematic data, which is used for, um, you know, data that comes from the car that gives you info profiles and, and usage and consumption of, of um, pr I guess, consumption, I would call it consumption of preferences that's coming out of the automobile. You've got integration with roadside, with rental agreement, with rental companies. Insurance companies, claim solutions, repair shops, traditional claims assessors, core IT platforms, payment, and then even things like law firms and roadside assistance and police. So, I mean, integrating this entire ecosystem is what you're seeing from an insurance perspective and how things are being delivered. So th that's something we talked about changing your mindset in terms of, um, you know, generation and innovation of ideas. Okay, let's talk about um, ideation flow. So, I mean, one of the, when you're doing innovation from a pure tactical perspective, I mean, what it usually comes down to is um, there's, you, companies have a innovation pipeline or an ideation pipeline. And really what that focuses on is the concept of, you know, bringing things into the product portfolio mix. It could be, when I say product, it can be a physical product, it can be a service, it can be an offering, it can be a capability. But it's really the whole concept here is the ideation. And this gets back to the whole thing we talked about, about, you know, organizational focus on innovation and, and, and culture getting within the DNA is generating these ideas in a way that we can look at them. And then from a tactical perspective, it's, you know, after we have the ideas, how do we score them? How do we view them in terms of, you know, opportunity that's presented to the enterprise, having clearly delineated um, scoring mechanisms that are used for bringing things into the project portfolio? And then push them all the way across. We talk about concept development. This is where you'd have a proof of concept type um, activities, which would be focused on, you know, develop the pro prototype, reconfirm the business case, make sure you've got all the different participating entities aligned, sales, marketing, engineering, in many cases, it depends, but there's, you know, there should be an organizational focus. And then, you know, at the end of this, we have the, you know, make the decision at the end of the um, development of the product, we have the business case that's confirmed, and then we push it all the way across um, out to actually monetization. Um, a lot of times what we what, I, what we see here <clears throat> from an organizational perspective is, you know, you, from ideation, you've got, you know, you could focus a project management activity on the R&D side of this, where you're actually, you know, developing the product, um, doing the business case, and actually carry it all the way to the launch concept. And then you could use like a CRM slash ERP solution for purposes of a monetization of it, <clears throat> where you take the product and actually, you know, monetize it, take it to market it, and, and actually have the capability to um, bring it out there. Um, so this is, you know, the ideation flow. And I mean, one of the things that a lot of companies need to do is we talk about innovation and, and the funnel quality. Um, here's a couple examples of, you know, 
what, what we're going to get out and how ways of actually qualifying the, the, the tools and capabilities that are within the tunnel in the funnel. So um, here's an example of a, this is a, you know, in this case, we've got, you know, how much enabling technology is it radical, next generation, incremental, base. And then you've got, you know, what is the concept perceived value for each one of the customers? You know, new category, new benefit, innovative variant, no change. So if you've got something where you've got a, you know, radical new category, that's a big, you know, that's a big bet. You know, I've got new benefit to an existing product line. Um, I mean, one of the things you see for R&D is there's two kinds. You can, you can have like a, you know, grow it or build it type mentality where you can actually take a, an existing product and enhance it, or you can take one that's an entirely radical new product and, you know, roll it out from there. Um, so, I mean, these would also be ones where you've got, you know, coming up with these alignments. So this is really, you know, what are we trying to score? And it's kind of interesting when they talk about the distribution here. I mean, organizations can make determinations about, you know, in terms of their incremental revenue target, how much of the incremental revenue they want to have associated with each one of these different models. Um, so, for example, in this case, you know, they made a decision of, you know, 25% of incremental will be focused on, you know, what I would call high risk stuff, you know, radical technology, next generation technology, new benefit, new customers. You know, here's ones where you're talking about. 60% um, of it associated with, you know, incremental development. Um, and then you'd have, you know, which is some, those that are talk, talking about, you know, base revenue, which is in effect, you know, small improvements to existing products, um, you know, not a very lot. But this is really can talk about like your, your risk profile way to think about it. And then you could talk about, you know, some of the scoring. You want to have consistent scoring for these particular um, products, you know, build by core, expand the core, disrupt the market. So this gets back to, you know, build the core. That's the green expand that's the blue disrupt the market that's the orange so i mean this this is a you know pretty decent schema of how companies can you know define their particular portfolio all right so let's talk about um how do we do this so let's go into um project online and i'll talk about you know some of the capabilities within the microsoft stack but also you know some best practices in terms of how we can go ahead and adopt these things um typically the way projects are brought in um, from an organizational perspective is, you know, you've, you've got this ideation piece. We talked about, for example, you know, within the charts, this whole kept concept here of ideation. And from an organizational perspective, if you, as they say, if you've got innovation in your DNA, you want to encourage people throughout the organization to come up with ideas. Um, it shouldn't just be technology, it should be marketing, it should be a broad form. And some of the most innovative companies I've worked with, you know, they everybody can come up with ideas. It can be a new product, it can be an enhancement to an existing product. Um, so these are all, you know, things that can be used. So, I mean, within the tool that we have, I mean, within Microsoft, within the Microsoft, Microsoft tool set, you know, you've got capabilities outside of the project management tool. Um, that could be used for purposes of, you know, capturing it, um, particular ideas. Um, for example, in this particular one, we can go, oops, I can create a new idea, pretty basic. Um, I mean, let me come up with, uh, let's see, let's call this. You know, description of it, submitter, put me in here. Costs, benefits. Um, these, the, from a best practice perspective, it's important that these, that the data elements that are captured um, are aligned with the business case. Um, one of the things about, you know, when we talk about project portfolio management, when we talk about business cases for for innovation, all these things should be aligned. I mean, it's important. And we talked about this um, last month when we talked about, you know, um, you know, portfolio management and scoring and ensuring that we've got consistent ROI and measure by ROI and um, key metrics. It's important that the metrics be aligned at the beginning of the process and consistent throughout the organization. Um, we could do risk profile, which can be associated with, like, for example, in, in, our prof, in our example here, is it build by core, expand the core, disrupt it by market. I um, mean, it could be used for codifying and quantifying exactly, you know, how we think the profile will be, what the start date might be, um, you know, then you can just save it. So, I mean, I've got a situation here where I just want to save this thing. So I'm right now, I'm acting like a user. So I'm sitting here and creating a new idea. Um, so somebody who, any person within the organization created an idea, um, you know, and then usually what you can do is it would be triaged and, and somebody would go ahead and review these things. Um, you can, what we can do here is within SharePoint, we can do like, you know, two or three tier level approvals. 
Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, one person. It can be, you know, multi-tiered approval systems that go. And then from there we go, let's just go into the, into the webinar, into the idea that we've got. So, I mean, what usually happens in this case, we can set up a notification for it. Uh, here's an example of the idea I just created. So I created an idea. It was added. Episode 4 webinar ID idea. Um, so you can actually have multiple steps within the approval process um, where it goes from, um, you know, it can be, that's actually a good best practice to have two steps in it because, I mean, as the level of specificity increases, um, you know, as, as it goes deeper into the, into the process, um, the cost associated with, um, you know, vetting the idea increases. So it's good to have, you know, multiple steps in, in it. So in this case, you know, I was the approver. I got an email notification saying, you know, here's the possible idea that we had. So I'm going to go back, you know, as the approver, edit this, go through and approve it, and go from there. Um, so I'll put myself in there. So, you know, in this particular case, I've approved the idea, saved it. So, you know, so this whole ideation piece can, can be pushed across um, all multiple, you know, multiple, you know, steps and levels. Um, there are other mechanisms you could use within the ideation piece. You could use SharePoint within um, the Microsoft Project Suite. Um, I've also seen people, you know, put web apps together where it can sit, you know, use SharePoint and create more custom, um, you know, web apps that can be used. But this is a pretty simple um, process here. So what I want to do if I want to create a project for this, I mean, this would be assuming it got all the way from, you know, two levels. If we want to do two levels of approval, I have the option here of creating a particular project. And all this can be automated. Go ahead and create a project for it. Um, what the within project online, there's PWA fields, project web access. These can all be defaulted. Um, the other thing you need to do is when you're creating the particular project, um, you would want to select a project type. Um, the project type would, would, would ref reflect, you know, what type of activity we're doing here. This would, again, not to be something that, you know, the masses would do. This would be the, one of the gatekeepers within the um, development phase, the people actually developing the um, proposal for the new product. You'd select an enterprise project type, and then go ahead and create the project. Give it a sec here, let it create the project. Okay, I created my project. So what I could do now is I can get out of um, project and go back to project online. Now, what happens here is once you get out of the SharePoint environment, um, at that point, it's gone from like a, you know, document-based idea into the project itself. Um, where thing, we've created a project for it. It'll have a project schedule. You can assign resources to the project schedule. It can go into portfolio management. It can go into um, resource management. Um, so all the project management and, portfolio and enterprise um, PPM activities, um, this new project, this project would be a candidate for inclusion into those calculations. So let's go into um, our projects here. Um, I did what I did. This is a list of the different project types that we have within our portfolio. Um, I'm using an outline function that allows me to segment it down. So if I go to outline to all levels, that'll allow me to see all the projects within the portfolio. I'm um, doing it by workflow stage, but that's fine. We'll do it that way then. That's fine. If you go to views, you can select whether, you know, how you want to view it, but I, I'm doing a portfolio by workflow. So we're going to look at it from the perspective of uh, where are we in terms of a workflow steps, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the project itself. So I went to project type was called PHS Demo. Um, if you go into the into the project center, there are the multiple steps that we have within the in the overall workflow. So if I go in, let's go to the first step. The your phases and stages is how that works within Project Online. You've got different phases and you've got the stages within it. Episode four webinar idea was the one we just created. Go ahead, click on that. 
and you'll see that since we have a project here, you know, this can this can actually flow into the overall um, product development phase. Um, we've got, you know, here's some example workflows that we've got. You know, the initial phase is, is initiation. Second one is proposal, planning, execution, and closing. So each one of these steps have a, you know, have a workflow phase associated with them. So we've actually gone from SharePoint, except taken the idea, vetted the idea, approved the idea, and we created a project for it. Now it's actually in the development um, within the project tool um, going forward. A um, couple of things to look at here. Um, you know, we talk about the different pieces within workflow. Um, in terms of, um, you know, within a project, you've got, you know, they call PDPs, project detail pages. Um, you'll see a couple other things here. If you go into project information, you know, this, this is all information that flowed through from SharePoint. Um, project details, you know, this is a project detail page that allows you to bring all the information that came across. So, you know, key data elements, we talked about ROI, we talked about, um, you know, understanding what constitutes and how do we define the value of a project. Um, these are all things that should be, um, that can flow through from the SharePoint piece um, along with calculations. So understanding your, your value proposition and how you define value going forward um, is pretty important. Um, the other aspect here is we've got a <clears throat> strategic impact. Um, what this does is it allows you, this is the, let's go look, take a look at this. Um, this allows you to score the candidate project um, based upon value levers. So from an organizational best practice perspective, you want to make sure that the portfolio levers that you use for, val for how you value a project for inclusion of the portfolio are aligned with the ROI and, and metrics that are associated with the um, intake process for innovation. So we can understand, you know, how do we define value and we'll make sure that we consistently score things organizationally um, and how and making sure that we have an organizational schema that goes ahead um, to support that. And then um, the schedule piece of this, uh, and, and so again, this is really important because this will this will flow into the portfolio and management piece. So you want to make sure that you know your everything is scored and 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 validated based on the consistent metrics. You don't want to have you know disalign misalignment there because that'll defeat the whole value of the organizational um, focus on like innovation or and value creation. And then the last part of this is the schedule, which would be defined based upon assigned to a project type, which would allow you to look at um, the different. Um, you know, components and elements of the particular project that are coming along. So, you know, everything, for example, if I'm doing new project development, I'm developing a new product, um, like if we were trying to implement this product, this all the way from here, all the way from business case development test to launch. Um, if you're doing a new product development piece, there should be a, um, you know, there would be a project schedule that would be associated with this. Um, in my experience, what you find is that there's different project schedules for innovation. You've got, you know, the add-on product, you've got the new product, um, you've got the one where there's a high degree of risk, low degree of risk, um, different levels of scrutiny that go with it. Um, again, it's important, the business case verification all the way through this cycle. You've got to make sure that this thing does not, you know, that, that they're still, that it's still valid from a business perspective. Um, in terms of best practice from a strategic impact perspective, you know, you should, can't, you, all projects, whether they're candidate projects, new projects, or existing projects, should be all be scored um, throughout the entire development life cycle because um, we want to make sure that we're not including something in the project portfolio, then the new product development portfolio that might have been the greatest thing since sliced bread, but is no longer the greatest thing since sliced bread. So you need to make sure that everything is being verified um, as it goes along. Um, and then the schedule, you know, these are, these are, you know, pretty important and they should be aligned with, you know, the scoring matrix that you would have for the overall, overall portfolio. For, for example, we talked about, you know, understanding what this value piece is here, how we, how we classify innovation and funnel quality. I mean, these are all things that, you know, we should be making sure we're measuring as well. Um, okay. So, so this is the project online piece of this. And I think there's other attributes you can use. And one of the great tools for this, of course, is Power BI. So if we wanted to go to Power BI, um, what you can do within Power BI here is really um, score and verify um, and, and have reports in place that allows you to um, manage the intake process and, and in the innovation process. Um, so, I mean, what this can do is really allows you to look at the quality of your pipe. Um, and if I'm one of the people whose job it is to approve it, you know, I have the opportunity to look at this and um, determine you know, whether I should pursue this particular project or whether I shouldn't pursue this project. Oops, apologize. So, I mean, we've got some examples that we, we've produced from a um, quantum PM perspective. And um, I don't know if how, I know P, 
people are new here, but what this is, this is Power BI. Um, it's another Microsoft tool that sits, um, that integrates across the Office 365 suite. Um, key concepts here really are, you know, the concept of reports and dashboards. Um, reports can be <clears throat> single source of, single system source um, capabilities where you bring different information from, you know, one source system, which is kind of targeted to a function. Excuse me. And then you've got, um, you know, dashboards, which are effective mashup of multiple reports that can be defined and, and um, you know, developed so that they are targeted towards a specific audience. Uh, best practice on reports and dashboards, don't over clutter the data. Okay, figure out exactly what the intent is of the report and design it in a way that conveys that piece of information. So for purposes of, you know, management of your process, we've got, we've developed some reports like Project Intake Report. Um, which can be focused on, you know, how do I go ahead and manage my funnel? So if you think about it, this particular example, what you've got is, you know, here's the cost estimation, the benefit estimation, you know, what the prioritization is, what the risks are, um, and these can be more dynamic. In this case, we've got a high, medium, and low type risk schema. Um, this is the breakdown here, and, and remember we talked about having a, a view for what the product, what the portfolio should look like. You know, this can be used to, you know, manage the mix of your in, intake process and the, and the ideas that are coming into the overall pipeline, and in effect, making sure we understand, how, you know, score them, how many are associated with, you know, disrupt the marketplace, how much of these are building out by core, um, and how much of these are expand the core. You know, you can use that to make sure that the portfolio reflects the, the strategy that your organization is being used. Um, and then making sure that we validate the business case um, going forward so we can understand what's the cost, what's the estimated benefit, you know, what's the priority value. You can have, you know, estimates and here's the budget cost. I would definitely want to add risk to this also. Um, I don't, that's not here, but it does give you the idea of validating what the risk profile is of this. Um, and then you could look at, here's some other ones on the bottom. There's other tabs. You could look at project funnel where I can sit there based upon the particular idea Top proposal and benefit by idea, so you can score these things out. Project benefit and cost, benefit and cost assumptions. Here's the proposed projects, and you can see what, what the priorities, risks are, benefit estimates. So this can give you an idea of going through and understanding what's out there. You'd want to add a status in here, so it would be reflective of where we are in terms of the workflow. I would want to, you know, initial idea, a stage gate one approval, stage gate two final approval that pushes it into the project area. Um, so this can be used to manage this component of it, and then you can have proposal details. Um, you know, this is just one idea, but you can actually um, come up with, like, let's let's figure out what some of these can look like. Let's, you know, let's, you know, what some of these ideas, and, and a lot of times are, you know, you know, it could just be simple verbiage. It doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a, a well thought out idea. Somebody come up with, you know, ideas can be very basic and um, germane. Um, but, you know, the ability to use Power BI to, to manage the overall intake funnel um, is, is pretty substantial um, going forward. Um, so, I mean, those are, you know, kind of the best practices that surround this. I mean, I would suggest, again, that, you know, having robust reporting is, is important. And the whole, the value of the intake, and I think, you know, let's talk about, you know, best practice again. I mean, I've been doing this, you know, ideation slash, in, you know, intake process, and a lot of companies you know, big companies are very much dependent on, you know, their ability to deliver, you know, groundbreaking products. I mean, for example, and, and a lot of times from a company perspective, you know, their, their Wall Street, their stock price, you know, and market value is very much aligned with, you know, their ability to deliver new things. Um, I mean, for example, I, I did the, the CPG company I was talking about earlier. I mean, they had one where, you know, they were something like, you know, they were guaranteeing like 20% of their revenue is coming from um, new products that are coming, that are going to be developed in the next two years. Okay, that is a tremendous bet that they're making with Wall Street. Okay, when 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 they have the when they have the Wall Street when they have the you know the 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 calls with the street so to speak you know where the CFO has to sit there and talk to the to the Wall Street analysts you know they have to have confidence that this intake process is actually working and that the, the dollar revenue that's being promised from the business case is actually going to be delivered. So it's it's pretty important this is actually happening. Um, and, you know, this whole concept of, you know, not being innovative. I mean, the fact is, the, the other aspect of this is that, you know, some of these innovation ideas are governed by things like IP and, and, and patents. Um, I mean, a lot of times when somebody develops a product, you know, they've got an exclusivity period in terms of the patent. So they need to make sure from, a, from an IP perspective, you know, not only do they have the idea, 
they want to develop and get it on market as, as quick as possible because the exclusivity exclusivity period of a patent is you know some 20 years in many cases um, so you know the longer you have exclusivity the longer that you have the revenue and profitability associated with it and the ROI so I mean this you know understanding what's going on from a development perspective is, is critical I mean another it, I did spend a lot of time working in pharmaceuticals too right and the whole uh, the validate the valuation of a pharmaceutical company is dependent upon what their R&D pipe looks like you know what what do products that they bring into market and the thing about people understand about pharmaceutical companies is they have to you know pay for companies they bring to pay for products they bring to market but also those they don't okay so there's a lot of money being spent on this and some of the ones that fail you have to pay for those too but um you know but the thing is understanding what what's coming out from a pipe perspective you know what is how long do we think we're going to have an exclusivity period from an ip perspective so you know how long is the patent valid for before um, it expires and some generic company comes along and starts manufacturing the same thing. So I mean, in terms of the, you know, this whole intake and innovation and, and ability to deliver product is, is absolutely essential for the, you know, ability of an organization to survive and, and the overall validation of it. Okay, that's, um, that's all I had. Hey, Lori, do we have any questions today or is that? Uh... No, no questions, John. No questions. Okay, well. That is going to be it. Next episode is coming up on May 22nd, PPM and resource management. Um, so hope everybody looks, for, everybody will join us for that one. And uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And um, have a nice Tuesday. Talk to you later.